This is stuff that most of us in this room probably should know, and if you don't know, I don't know how you got to college. All right, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. They're your macronutrients. Carbohydrates and protein have four calories per gram. Fats have nine calories per gram. There are, for example, food sources that provide each of those macronutrients and how they blend. All right? It's a lot. All right, then you got your micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, all right? You got your A, B, C, D, E, you got your calcium, magnesium, sodium, things like that, iron, those are your minerals, so slide. Those are your micronutrients. Your vitamins break down into two categories, water-soluble and fat-soluble vitamins. The acronym for fat-soluble vitamins is K, K, A, D, and E. What's that mean if you have fat-soluble vitamins? You probably need some sources of fat in your diet to help those vitamins break down in your body, all right? When you get your water soluble vitamins, your B vitamin group, and your uh, C vitamin, vitamin C. Slide. All right. Generally, for I got any biochemist in here or like, all right, one of you understands what these charts mean. The rest of you just know this is the process of how we break down protein, carbohydrate, and fats. All right. And you can see carbohydrates and fats take away for everybody. They can get used in the same energy cycle, right? Your, your Krebs cycle, your citric acid cycle, however you view it. They both get used in the same. So your long-term energy sources normally come from carbohydrates and fats. Aerobic, the aerobic energy system can be fueled by both. All right, it's like, all right, carbohydrates. It's your fastest acting macronutrient. You have about five solid pathways or more of how your body can in process Carbohydrates turn into glycogen. At any one time, your body stores about 500 grams of glycogen in your muscles, all right? Anybody actually a marathon runner in here or run a marathon? All right, a couple of you guys. You all heard about hitting the wall, right? Roughly about mile 20. All right, hitting the wall mean, generally means you run out of glycogen. That 500 grams is starting to disappear. You're hitting the wall, you run out of energy in the carbohydrates into the term. So your body has to tap into a different fuel source, normally fats, body fat storage, right? So that's the general concept of what hitting the wall really is. All right, slide. All right, fats. So your fats, they work for cell membrane structure, making enzymes, hormones, carrying vitamins. There's a and then they are the body's biggest energy source. Let's talk body fat, right? Everybody got body fat? What do you think we have body fat for? Uh, it's, it's for insulation, energy sources, all right? So that's why if you have an extremely low body fat, it's dangerous to a point, all right? Well, ideally, most athletes, you know, you want to sit, they want to sit around 8 to 10%. They don't want to be at that bodybuilder level of you're down in the 5% or so lower, they're closer to 8% because it helps with nervous system signaling, energy source, things like that. So, and then general population, you're probably closer to about 15%. But it's there as an energy source, all right? Fats break down into you have your omega-3s, your omega-6s, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated fats will break down further. Slide. Then you get your protein, all right? Protein works for <coughs> enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters, antibodies, transport proteins, and muscle protein. Not the greatest source for energy. If necessary, they can turn into an energy source, but they're not generally wanted to be used for energy. All right? So you'll break down those uh, protein, break it into its amino acid components, restructure those amino acids into another type of protein. Eventually, your body can take that protein, break it down, and reuse those amino acids in another <coughs> compound. Just like playing Legos or Jenga. You know, you're just removing pieces and putting them out other places, all right? So your body has essential and non-essential amino acids. The non-essential, your body can produce. The essential, your body has to get from the food source, all right? That makes sense? Slide. All right, then we talk basal metabolic rate and resting metabolic rate. So this is your Natural calorie expenditure. Your BMR is the amount of calories your body needs to survive. Think of being in a coma. That's how many calories your BMR is, how many calories your body needs to be in a coma where there's like zero function in your body. 
just enough to breathe. Make sense? About 10% higher is your resting metabolic rate. That's about the amount of calories you need to sit on the couch from 09 on Saturday to watch college game day, all the way to the last game, if you're watching the Pac-12 at like 1 in the morning. That's true. RMR, all right? And then exercise pushes that calorie, those calorie needs, 30% higher or more, depending on how much you exercise in general. Somewhere between 10 to 30 plus percent higher than your BMR. Make sense? All right, slide. Everything we're going to talk about left, we're going to think that or more plus exercise calories. You know? All right, so energy balance. Three types of energy balance. You have your isochloric energy balance, energy in equals energy out. Taking enough calories to sustain the calories you're burning. Then you have your weight loss, your negative calorie balance. Calories in are less than calories out. Very. Not often are you going to deal with people on a, on a weight loss program in the Army, unless they're on the Army Body Compensation Program. You guys will be eventually attending a place that specializes in weight loss, Ranger School. There are some uh, negatives. Choose that extreme calorie balance. All right. With that negative balance, you're going to have a decreased cognitive function. You're going to, your body's going to reset itself. It's now going to have a lower RMR, right? A lower resting metabolic rate. It has been starved for so long, it needs to reset itself to operate. With lower in its RMR, it's going to decrease some of its natural function. So now you're going to have a decreased thyroid, thyroid hormone output, reduced muscle mass. Your body's going to repair itself less because it had to reset its RMR to try to hit homeostasis at a new decreased level of calories. So an extreme negative calorie balance for a long period of time is never a good thing. That's why if you look at your body when you've come out of ranger school, it could take weeks and months to reset itself because it's probably reset its RMR, its hormone functions are completely different. Almost everybody develops a ranger baby after ranger school, no matter what. It drove me up a wall. I mean, I spent like six weeks with a ranger baby. I'm like, I'm training two hours a day. I have no idea why it's happening. It's because your body has reset itself and your hormones are all over the place. So accept that it's there. Like, don't try to restart yourself because you developed a ranger baby. I may have tried that. It didn't work. All right. And then when you have a negative calorie imbalance, you also have lower nutrients, which increases fatigue, insomnia, impaired <coughs> growth, cramps, muscle atrophy, bone loss, all that stuff. All right. Then you have a positive calorie balance, normally known as weight gain. You're taking more calories than you need. Sometimes that's a benefit. If you're competing in a sport that's body weight, you may want to go to a higher weight class. You know? With that, your resting RMR will increase. The body is all about homeostasis. You know, now you're providing, think of PT, we have provided a stimulus, increased calories. Now your body is going to adapt to that increased calories, it's going to raise its RMR. You know, it's going to find a new homeostasis based on, hey, you've been increasing its calories. So it's like, bro, I now need 2,000 calories to operate instead of 1,500. Think. You know? So you get that positive calorie balance. All right, so you got glycemic index. With glycemic index, we're talking about how carb timing breaks down in the body. The lower the glycemic index, the more, the slower those carbs break down. The higher the glycemic index, the faster the carbs <coughs> break down. You know? And it deals with your insulin levels. All right? Lower glycemic index, what? Lower glycemic index stuff doesn't spike your insulin as much, like vegetables and fruits, because normally they're lower than carbs too. He can give you a, a sustained burst instead of Skittles, which is a quick shock and breaks out in about three seconds. You know? But note that if you're eating a meal, the glycemic indexes can wash themselves out. Because you'll have an item at 15 for your glycemic index, maybe one at 80, one at 50, one at 40, it washes itself out and they become like null and void in the sense when you're eating a regular meal. Now, if you're worried about glycemic index, you're probably eating a item as itself, as one lone quantity. All right. Slide. All right. With the right macronutrients, with carbs, you also want to make sure you have a source of fiber, both a mix of soluble and insoluble fibers. 
Soluble fiber slows di digestion, makes you feel full warm. Insoluble fiber helps clean you out, right? Insoluble fiber works a lot better than a cleanse you bought off the shelf. Because all that cleanse you bought off the shelf is doing is the same thing that insoluble fiber is doing. It's just causing you to evacuate in an unhealthy manner your body. Whereas insoluble fiber will do it in a normal healthy manner. Alright, slide. Alright, choosing the right macronutrients for fats. Alright, so get this. You got saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fat. Ideally, you want to conserve them in a one to one to one ratio. Yeah, I just told you, saturated fat is consumed in the same amount as monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Well, in half, I guess you could say, since it's one to one to one. All right, but you want to consume them in a balanced ratio. All right, saturated fat is not the mythical enemy. Most of that information that came out about saturated fat, you're talking 60s, 70s. Hey, we try to correlate it to heart disease and things like that. It did not cause heart disease. They, like graphing the increase in heart disease with an increase of saturated fat in the diet. Well, if I overlay, say, cigarette smoking on that same graph, hey, cigarette smoking correlates just as well to heart disease as, say, saturated fat does. Saturated fat consumption did not cause an increase in heart disease. It is a plethora of things that cause an increase in heart disease in the population. This is no. People who increase their saturated fat intake had a list of problems that they probably increased as well. So there isn't a causation thing. They probably were smokers. They probably were not fit. So to tie it to one thing, kind of a bad use of science. Make sense? And that's why you see the USADA and all those places kind of backtracking their talk on saturated fat. Now trans fat and all that other stuff, ooh, just avoid that. You can just stay away from trans fat, but saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated, they're fine. All right? Trans fat is its own other thing. More of a chemical problem. All right. So then when we're looking at omega-3 and omega-6 fats, those are your polyunsaturated fats broken down. Alright? So you got your omega-3 and your omega-6. You have their food sources up there. One is anti-inflammatory, one's inflammatory. Alright? And then you got your monounsaturated. Alright? Let's go slide. Go like four slides in the middle. Make sure I keep going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. I make sure I get this right. Oh, back, back, back. Four to one. <coughs> All right, now we're good. I spend so much time. Keep going. Back to work. Oh, no. Two. All right. So omega-3 and omega-6. What do we think the normal diet in America consumes? What's the ratio? 1 to 50. Ooh, close. 1 to 19. So inflammatory fats to non to anti-inflammatory fats is consuming a ratio of 1 to 19. All right. Ideally, you want a 1 to 1 of omega-3 to omega-6. So you actively have to work at any sources that reduce the omega-6 content in your diet and increase the omega-3 content in your diet, all right? Because you want to decrease the natural inflammatory response your body's going to have to the food it's eating. Does that make sense? All right. Slide. All right. Choosing the right macronutrient for protein. All right. So on my left, or my left, your right, we got our bioavailability for protein, how well your body does at its efficiency at absorbing the amount of protein available based on those food sources. All right? So, hey, chicken, beef, fish, egg whites, you know, all pretty, they're all relatively the same, you know, so you can have any of those sources and you're going to get about the same benefit. Now, when you get down to the vegetable side, your soy, your rice, you know, your peanuts, your beans, you know, it's not as available, you know? It doesn't provide everything you need, and it does not as efficient as being broken down. All right? Now, if you look at, hey, steak, mm -hmm. pork, chicken, all about the same amount of protein per serving size. All right? So you got some variety in there. Slide. All right. And since we talked about fats, that they're okay to have, that means you don't have to limit yourself 
to lean meat, all right? You don't have to be like, well, I'm just going to have lean meat. As long as you're meeting your daily allowance of what you have for fats and other macronutrients, you don't have to have lean meat, all right? Because fat is a good source. As you'll, we'll get farther in the class in the sports nutrition section, you'll learn that, hey, 50% of your, some of you 50% of your diet needs to be fat, and 40% of your diet needs to be fat. To meet that fat content, you can't eat solely lean meat, or else you're going to be drinking like olive oil and butter on a daily basis. <laughs> No? So beef in that sense is okay as long as you're <coughs> in. All right? So just be looking at that when you're making your food choices. Lean meat is not like what you need to take away. As long as it's healthy, like beef, chicken, steak, things like that, and you're within your realm, your 40% or 50% or 30% of fat intake, you're good. You're good. All right? It's more about the balance at the end of the day. Slide. All right. And then these are USADA's recommended allowance for certain vitamins and minerals, all right? You got your macro minerals, you need more than 100 milligrams a day. Your micro minerals, less than 15 milligrams a day. A lot of times, you're going to come up short on things like vitamin D, calcium, iron, things like that. Vitamin D, if we were at Fort Drum or Alaska, it's going to be hard to come by. Why? Because it's partly synthesized by the sun. Solution to that. You can use a cane bed. You know, if you can see the sun, it helps synthesize vitamin D, or you can spend enough time in the sun in the summer that your body can store a little bit of vitamin D to get you through a section of the winter. All right. And then you've got iron, which is another one that certain percentage of the population are normally at risk of being deficient in iron, making them anemic. All right. We all know, you guys are a general guess of who that section of the population is? What? Females. All right, so as we become a gender integrated formation, that's just one thing to know. Your female population has a tendency to be more anemic than the male section of the population. Your males can be anemic, but females have a tendency, or are at risk of being anemic more because they continually have more blood loss than men, so they have a lower rate of iron. If you, have, if you are anemic, you do not transport oxygen as well in your body, which reduces your ability to extend your aerobic performance. So, just, so most women should be on an iron side. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, how many of you guys take supplements anyways? Yeah, I have to work. You know, that's all it is. It's just adding like a multivitamin basically at the end of the day. And once all pregnant women end up on a prenatal vitamin that is a little higher in iron. So just think about that with your formations. You know, if you got women, I would recommend that, hey, you might want to get on an iron supplement to improve your performance. And I actually had one student, and like two cycles ago, dude is an animal, 500 pound squat, just jerks like 300 pounds, 240, eats like two dinners a night. Dude was anemic. Don't know why. So one thing, you may have men in your formation too that are anemic as well. And you, like if you're if you are at a loss of how they are not performing aerobically, everything says they're good. Send them to the doctor, get them checked out. Dude was just struggling on the five mile, like right there. I couldn't figure out why. Did his ranger physical, comes back at 240 pounds, handfuls of red meat, he was anemic. Got all an iron supplement, he was golden. So, I don't know how he ended up anemic, but just one thing to look at, just in the future. Now, I've heard, uh, might not be right, but I've heard that iron supplement, you can over supplement iron, and it can cause problems. Is that true, or am I just... Yeah, you can over supplement iron. So when you go, like, if you're getting your blood checked to be anemic, the doctor will prescribe the iron supplement mm -hmm. and, the right, and the right dosage for what you need based on your levels. All right. Slide. These are just a graph of generally how many people are deficient in the population of certain... Now, 34% of the population is not meeting the right amount of iron. We're super lacking in calcium and vitamin B, things like that. All right, slide. All right, now the stuff that matters, the sports nutrition portion. All right, so we're talking meals, all right? Your anytime meal, two-thirds of your plate should come from vegetables, all right? If a quarter of that plate should be protein, and a sixth of that plate fat. All right. Why vegetables? All right, let's back up to our glycemic index. Slow, they're slower digesting. 
they control that insulin level a lot better. You know, it doesn't spike as much and drop as well. You're, it's still a source of carbohydrates, but it's not causing quick spikes and quick falls. All right? So that's why. And based on hormone profiles, there are certain times where you want to have the high glycemic carbs versus the low glycemic carbs. In this case, at our any time meal throughout the day, we'll, you want two thirds of it being the low glycemic carbs. Post workout, we'll bring in half the plate protein, half the plate your vegetable carbs, and then you can have your serving of the starchy stuff, the high glycemic carb, because your body is more sensitive to insulin post workout. So if you're a breakfast person, you know, after breakfast is your time to have pancakes, you know, for most people. That's when you're gonna have the super starchy carbs. You know, pancakes, your cereals, things like that. You know, because we're morning PTers in the army. If you're an afternoon workout guy, we're saying don't have pancakes in the morning, save it, you can have nachos at night, you know, after your post-evening workout, things like that. And then water, tea as a beverage of choice, why? Because it's calorie free. All right? Slide. All right, so portion size. General rule of thumb. Men, you can have two palm size portions, 40 to 60 grams. Everybody's palms are different, but made to their body size. Women, you're at one. We say men and women here because we're talking body size. You know, average female is going to be a lot smaller than the average male, and then I fall somewhere in the middle. All right, now, 130 pounds, and then a lot of you guys are 180 and above. So, portion size is based on body size. All right, because body size determines calorie content intake. Because you have a distinct, different RMR. All right, then you got vegetables, fist size portions. All right, you view vegetables in a fish, vegetables in a fist size portion. Carbohydrates, cut. Is your hands cup size portion? Fats, thumb size portions. All right. General proportion. Unless you want to go super crazy, you can get on a food scale. You know, bam. You get simple measures right here. All right. Slide. All right. By body type, your diet should be different. Three body types. You got your ectomorphs. You dudes are my hard gainers. You're my natural marathon runners. My endurance guys. Like, you could look at a barbell, you could take steroids, and you're still probably not gaining any weight. All right? Some of you guys know who you are here, right? You guys are the super sensitive people to insulin. You can eat almost anything you want, and you're not going to have a problem. Then you got the other end of the spectrum, <coughs> my endomorphs. You know? You guys have a hard time losing weight. You normally are like, hey, I'm big boned. All right? <laughs> you naturally are the defensive tackle for, or, yeah, the defensive tackle for Alabama. And then in the middle of this spectrum, you got my mesomorphs. If any of you guys have seen Life Fire Committee, this is what we call Star and Barbell. He looks at a barbell and he gains 10 pounds. All right? He just, you naturally put on muscle very easily. Every cycle, he'd come back and be like, yeah, I started working out at the gym. I gained like 15 pounds. Like, dude, that was two weeks ago. <laughs> and it's like solid muscle. So you have those natural mesomorphs. Based on what body type you naturally are, your hormone and nervous system operate slightly differently, which means your diet needs to match your hormone and nervous system profile. All right? Flat. For this, an ectomorph, your diet should consist of 25% of your calories coming from protein. 55% of your diet can come from carbohydrates and 20% from fat. All right? So your main energy source is an ectomorph can be carbohydrates for the most part. You're the most insulin sensitive of the three body types. So your body can process carbs a lot better without storing them as body fat right away. Does that make sense? All right, your mesos. 30% of, of your diet is protein. 40% should be carbs. You become, as we go down this chart, less insulin sensitive, all right? And 30% of your diet is fat, all right? Your protein intake has increased because mesos really have more muscle than ectos. So you need a little more of your diet to come from protein. Okay? And then endos, 35% of your diet needs to be protein, 25% carbs. 40% of your diet comes from fat. So you guys are the ones who can eat a lot more beef than chicken because you need a lot more fat in your diet than you need carbs. Make sense? All right. Slide. 
Alright, so now we go to calorie intake guidelines. Alright, so determine your estimated calorie needs. So we start with estimated, and then once you figure out a ballpark of what you need, you can fine tune it based on your body, based on your goals. So gain weight, lose weight, sustain weight. Alright, so you take your body weight, and then you multiply it based on, if, we'll say, weight maintenance, right? Everybody wants to maintain weight around here, we'll say? We'll consider all of us very active, because most of you guys are very active. So you take your body weight times the factor of 16 to 18, you know, that builds your range. So if you're 145, <coughs> multiply by 16 to 18, you need between 23 and 2600 calories. If you're 215, you need between 3400 and 3800 calories, all right? Once you get a ballpark, then you can figure out where in that range your body needs to sustain itself, all right? For me, at about 165, I need 26 to 2,900 calories, and I know based for me, I can live close to the 2,600 calorie range and maintain weight. No matter how, no matter what my fitness level is, for the most part, I'm pretty good on the lower end. It's just how my body functions. Now, you may be on the higher end. Nothing wrong with that. Well, your grocery bill is going to be a little more expensive. But, uh, just note that, and then once you figure out your calorie needs. Then you can multiply it by the chart in the back. Hey, 30% of the of 2,600 calories needs to be how many calories I have fat, or how many calories protein if I'm a mesomer. And then you can divide that by four, and then you know how many grams of protein you need in your diet generally. Generally, if you're an athlete, you need about 1.4 to 1. Point, or to 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight to sustain performance, all right? That's your general guideline. You know, an average person needs about 1 to 1.2, a complete sedentary person about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, all right? So you're generally sitting about 1.4 to 1 to 2, which means, hey, you may need a protein supplement to meet your daily protein needs, all right? Just note that. I normally do, if I'm going to try to beat all my protein intake, I probably need to take protein chips, or I'm going to come up short. Alright, slide. Alright, so pre and post workout nutrition. Alright, ectos, pre workout, you can have a protein carb drink and a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 1 ratio. You know, during your workout, you can have like protein carb drink, like muscle milk or something. And then post workout, hey, protein carb drink or solid meal, something like that. My mesos, hey, just eat normally. You can have a protein carb drink in your workout if you want. And then you can do a solid meal or a protein carb drink after. Endos, hey, eat a meal, eat a meal after, do some BCAAs or a, a protein carb drink. I think most of us around here don't really do any of that stuff during the workout because it's short enough that you're not coming up super hungry. I've rarely, I think, eaten during the workout. <coughs> I'm trying to think of that. But, so that's just your basic pre and post workout nutrition. A lot of it has to do with your body type and your insulin hormone response. All right. Who's heard of their, that anabolic window after training where you need to get food inside you right away? Ah, a lot of you. All right. How big is it? 30 minutes? An hour? What happens if you miss it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Alright, so it's partially a myth. Hear it out. Alright, so that anabolic window was determined over short term research studies, like two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Do a lifetime of training, <laughs> that window you find out is like six hours, four hours eight hours, somewhere in the much longer range before you lose, like before you need to fuel yourself. So in the long term, you do not need to, once Star Wars <coughs> releases you, you don't need five minutes later to be in the PX or in the shop at buying yourself a muscle. You'll survive, all right? That window is a lot longer in the long term <coughs> lifetime of your training. Than it is in a short term quick study for benefit, all right? It is not like this super tiny window, it's actually very big. Okay? So, slide. Alright, carbohydrate timing. This also plays in it. Based on body type. So you've got my like high carbohydrate tolerance people. Tolerance people. Start your carbs. You can, be, you can eat them every meal. If you want pancakes every meal, you're good. You tolerate insulin. Awesome. So, 
And then you want to consume your veggies to fruit, low glycemic, high glycemic, three to one. All right? You, know, you don't want to slowly sock yourself on Skittles because Skittles and an orange. The only difference between them is the nutrients. But the carbohydrate, like, breakdown, pretty similar. All right, you got your, mod uh, your moderate carb tolerance people, your mesos. You want to eat starchy carbs in moderation. You don't want to spike that insulin weight too much. All right? You're in a, you're in a ratio of 4 to 1, right? Due to your insulin sensitivity, you want to go more on the lower glycemic beginning of the day. And instead of having starchy carbs at every meal, maybe one or two. Do breakfast and dinner and not at lunch, things like that. You want to minimize that. And my endos, my four carb people, you know, if you're watching football on Saturday, you might want to work out before you start having the carbs from your Budweiser and your nachos. Because your carb tolerance is in the tank. Post workout's about the only time your body is really equipped to handle starchy carbs on a daily basis. You're having that ratio between veggies and fruit at a five to one. All right, slide. All right, nutrition <coughs> for injury recovery. First stage of an injury, you have inflammation, you have proliferation, and then you got that remodeling section, right? So with that inflammation, adding sources of inflammation from your diet, remember those omega-6 fats, probably not a good thing. Your body's already in an inflamed state. Why add more? inflamed state. Right. You want to increase if you're in an injury and it's causing you to be sedentary to maintain your muscle mass. You want to increase your protein. Right? It's not necessarily an energy source. It's not your fat or carb. It's more for your hormones, your neurotransmitters, your muscle building. To two to two and a half grams per kilogram of body weight. Right? That'll help you sustain and you can increase your protein content, your, your omega-3 content, you actually sustain your performance longer throughout an injury, all right? That's helpful with your injury maintenance. Still want to keep your diet, sticking to whole foods, not processed foods, things like that, all right? Slide. All right, general, another infographic, what kind of foods you want to be looking for, what you don't want to be eating, you know? Slide. All right. Alcohol. All right. So, on average, most of you guys in this room probably consume alcohol, right? You're all over the age of 21. All right. Shockingly, alcohol impairs cognitive function. Oh my gosh. Crazy. You guys all know that. All right. Alcohol has a diuretic effect when it's above 4%. Alright, so you pick a little water drinkers, maybe you're hydrating. Don't know where the research comes from this, but hey, if it's under 4%, potentially it does not have a diuretic effect. Alright, alcohol impairs your sleep quality when you get up to sleep, just know that. Alcohol and protein synthesis, it puts it in a tank, you know, alcohol will affect your bone density. I got it, okay, you guys are going to drink. So you got all the negatives of alcohol, you've heard all this. Alright, so alcohol and PT. If you're going to work out and drink in the same day, space them out, okay? <coughs> work out in the morning if you're going to go out on a Friday night. So your body has time to recover from that workout, all right? You have time to have some protein synthesis, you know? Preferably, take a nap in between your workout and going out so you get a little bit of recovery and regeneration post-workout, all right? That's to get the best benefit because if you don't, and you do your, hey man, you hit bench press at 5 o'clock on Friday, and you're down at Scruffy Murphy's by 7.30 that night, you pretty much could have just gone to Scruffy Murphy's at 5 o'clock, and the only thing that would have been worse is you probably spent more money, all right? Because it's going to, the alcohol is going to kill your body's ability to recover, so therefore, any adaptation you had to that workout probably went in the negative direction. Now, instead of being able to recover from it in 12 hours, it's going to take you 24 to 48, which is going to make preceding workouts much worse. Make sense? So, if you're going to drink, space it out and try to take a nap. That's the practical implication. I would advise, hey, not drinking is probably your best option, but I live in reality around this place. I'm not going to be like that medical white coat nurse who's like, no, you should never drink. When you do your gap, I don't drink, ever. Nope, never. I've seen alcohol. <laughs> don't use tobacco either. Yeah. Fine. All right. So, hey, they're not the they're not the enemy. All right. 
Supplements and steroids are not the same thing. Right? <laughs> supplements for endurance performance. Beneficial supplements, research supported that work. No, caffeine, it is a beneficial supplement. If you've seen me around, I probably am drinking a monster of coffee. I do drink water occasionally. Uh, a carbohydrate gel or drink, something like that. That counts as a supplement because it's supplementing your diet. All right? Beta alanine, it helps buffer against lactate acid. The other better supplement in this sense would be baking soda. Baking soda neutralizes vinegar, buffers against acid. Baking soda also will destroy your intestines on the inside <laughs> and create some problems on the other end. So I'd stick to beta alanine, but at a certain point, uh, if I remember correctly my history of track and field, they thought about making baking soda an illegal supplement because it buffers lactic acid. So uh, it'll help us pass, though, right? What? If you're not in the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, you may be in the bathroom after taking a hat. So beta alanine, going to be the better option, right? <laughs> beta alanine itself does not necessarily make you tingly, as most of you know of taking it. It's the histine in there. It kind of creates an allergic reaction, kind of makes that tingly feeling. It's a marketing thing. It sells. If you tingle, you're like, oh, this works. This is so awesome. <laughs> no? Hey, caffeine. I think if I remember, it's like 3.25 milligrams per kilogram of body weight is kind of what you're looking at for a max dosage. Genetics determine how tolerant you are of caffeine, so play with it. Don't like do the math right now and be like, oh, I'm taking 400 milligrams of caffeine, and then you pass out on the range. All right? And you say, well, the nutrition guy said I could do that. You know, my wife's super sensitive to caffeine. She can't do it, I can do it. I'll take a pre-workout and then swallow a caffeine pill, and I'm good to go. Like nothing, I'll go to sleep in an hour. Her, she thinks I'm going to have a heart attack and she'll take you hospital that day because she is really sensitive. It's just genetic. All right. Uh, the taurine, the carotene, the active, all the other stuff, hey, research is mixed. May work, may not. Try it. If it works for you, hey, great. If it doesn't work for you, don't spend your money on it. All right. Ephedrine, it's illegal. Don't take it. Uh, all the other herbal supplements don't work. That's like peeing in a pond and telling me like that big pond is full of pee because they're so diluted it, it don't make a difference. Homeopathic medicine, L arginine for your pump doesn't work. Research doesn't support it. All right, for strength supplements, best ones creatine and protein. Protein, why increase your protein? Increases your protein synthesis. Creatine, ATP, creatine phosphate energy system, right? All right, the ATP creatine phosphate energy system. Adding creatine phosphate, the supplement, to the energy system increases the availability of phosphate ions. If you increase that, instead of, your, instead of that cycle lasting seven seconds, you make it eight or nine seconds out of it. Over the long term, that's eight or nine seconds of work per set, you can do more, which increases your capacity. All it is, it's like adding an extra energy source, but it's specifically designed for that energy system. Where it's like increasing a carbohydrate or a gel drink will add to your aerobic or anaerobic energy system. Increasing your creatine content adds to that ATP CP system. Make sense? All right. Uh, then you have BCAAs, mixed review, they're your branch chain amino acids, you know, stuff on that. Hey, ZMA, testosterone boosters, your herbal supplements. <coughs> Most of the research says it doesn't work, don't waste your money. Steroids also illegal, so don't add those into your diet. Those are effective because it is a hormone, but it's illegal. And it has a lot of negative consequences. All right, health, you have probiotics, electrolytes, vitamin D, things like that. You know, multivitamins are mixed, fish oils are mixed. Ibolux doing a study with fish oils right now, seeing if they work, you know, with your omega 3s. So it's mixed reviews on that. Some people say they work, some say they don't. Multivitamins, you know, it's mixed reviews for seven bucks. Hey, it's worth trying it because most multivitamins are cheap. I like the gummy ones, so I try them. When I buy the regular pill form, I never take them, so I just buy the gummy ones. <laughs> They're probably way less effective, but they taste good. So, that's just me personally. All right, supplements. All right. Supplements are going to dehydrate you, all right? But so does eating a cheeseburger, all right? So if you add an additional substrate to your body, if I go get a cheeseburger, it's going to pull water from my muscles to help dissolve it, right? If I take a supplement, it's got to help absorb it, so I'm going to pull water. So, cheeseburger, steak, supplement. 
all same end state, okay? So you need to consume more water if you're going to add more of a substrate to your body. If you're going to have a little bit more creatine, have another glass of water. If you're going to eat a cheeseburger, have another glass of water. If any of you want to go to Sears school one day, during the survival session, they'll talk about if you don't have water, you don't eat because it'll dehydrate you. So until you have water, you shouldn't eat until you have enough water. Like, I think it's a canteen worth, do not eat a meal, all right? So it's the same thing with supplements. If you're gonna take them, add more water to your diet, they have no other special dehydrating effects. Does that make sense? Okay, fine. All right, we'll talk special diets real quick. All right, so you got a very low, low calorie diet, known as Ranger School, but some people do real low calorie diets outside of Ranger School. Short period of time, you know, your calories are nine to 11 times the body weight, all right? Where you need to maintain your protein content so you don't lose muscle. That's a short term thing. Think wrestler trying to cut weight. You know, real short term, not very healthy. Not recommended for high bowling, unless you are struggling to get to the Army body <coughs> No, and you shouldn't be because we have to two sticks. So you'll be fine. All right, then you got your very low carbohydrate diets. They're coming very popular in the endurance world. All right, the first one, the first diet then generally carbs on your low carb diet, 20 to 20 to 10 percent, somewhere in that range. Normally we we'll call a low carb diet under 20 percent of your general calorie intake. All right, then you go super low carb is your ketogenic, 25 to 50 grams of carbs based on your body chemistry. You know. A guy who is an ecto is probably going to need to drop even more, right? Down to 25 grams because of his insulin sensitivity. It's forcing your body to use ketones instead of <coughs> gluc glucose and stuff like that to fuel itself. Fat. The biggest energy system in the body, right? Most people are averaging 15%. Readily available. Like 500 grams. Big store, little store. If people become fat adapted and are always using their fat, like endurance marathon runners, they don't hit a wall, per se, because they're already using their body fat. They're already adapted to it, so they have a benefit of doing a ketogenic diet. All right, that's where you're going to see a lot of it. Now, there's some researchers who are powerlifters who have dabbled with it for that performance, but for performance benefits, you're normally going to see that outside of health, like some diabetics are going to ketogenic diets to help their symptoms, but for performance, you're looking at ultra marathon runners. All right, and things like that. Endurance athletes to avoid hitting the wall. Make sense? All right, and then you got your carbon calorie cycling, you're dealing with fat storage where you do a very low carb or very low calorie diet for the seven to 14 days, you do a refeed period with three to three and a half times. The diet in carbs or calories, you can do three to four days of going low carb and do a refeed, kind of messing with your insulin level, working with your fat storage, you know. That's just all looking at weight loss and body composition. Not stuff needed for eye bullet, but I want you to know that it's out there and those are some of the problems, some of the different things. All right, slide. Then you got carb or calorie cycling, working at muscle gain, working at more bone levels. You go carbs, 80% of your recommended carbs in one day, 100%, then 120%. Then you just keep rotating that out. That's carb cycling. Very high carbohydrate diets is like the exact opposite of very low carbohydrate diet. Now you're trying to be a marathon runner and you're trying to get 70% of your diet through carbs. You know, you're trying to cluster carbs up above that 500 grams, in theory. You know, it's a short-term thing. Think carb load. Only works for long-distance runners, marathon or greater. Things that exceed the 500 grams of glycogen. <coughs> that two-mile, that's like five skips, all right? That's not a endurance event in the sense of nutrition. All right, and then your last type of diet is intermittent fasting. All right, extended periods of not eating. Normally between an eight, uh, 16 to 20 hour window or multi or a day because it drops your insulin levels, it controls your body fat content, and then you do a refeed period. And within that refeed period, you're eating a regular amount of calories. So like if you're a 3,000 calorie a day guy, and you're doing a 20 hour intermittent fasting period, you're eating like 3,000 calories in four hours. All right? All these different diets, they're <laughs> normally like lifestyle type things. Your body naturally is okay at doing them. I naturally can intermittent fat on a daily basis. Most of the cadre can tell you, I could go 20 hours without eating and I'm perfectly fine. And I'll consume my calories. That's normal for me. Low carb diet, I like chips and salsa, I like nachos, not normal for me. You know, my wife can do it a lot better than I can. 
You know, that's, that's for her. She tried intermittent fasting and hated it. So when you are trying some of these, you look at what fits your body, because it's sustainable, you know? What are you mentally capable of doing? I will probably never be mentally capable of a low carb diet outside of like five days. No? All right, slide. Boom, let's go to sleep class. Don't worry, it's short. Let's go, yeah, go to the bottom. <coughs> You guys are like, oh, it's eyeball, like, we're going to sleep. Why are we learning about it? All right, end state. If you guys learn, like, nutrition, sleep, and PT, we can still have a culture shift in the Army. And this concept of sleep, which has so many benefits, it's like, not even, like, I could talk for hours on this week. Like, we need it. All right, slide. All right, sleep. Broken into stages, all right? And you have cycles. You have multiple cycles throughout the night. Sleep breaks up into stages, we'll go one through five, all right? Some people will say it's only four stages, they combine stage three and four, so. For this purpose, we're going five. All right, first stage, it's your light sleep, you start to fall asleep. Stage two is where you spend about 50% of your sleep time, all right? Breathing, heart rate slows, decrease in body temperature. Then you go to stage three and four, this gets into your very deep sleep, all right? Your non-REM sleep. This is where your body restores itself with the slow delta waves, like you don't move in deep sleep. Everybody tracking? And then you go to your stage five. Hey, this is your rapid eye movements, okay? This is where you dream. A majority of your memory consolidation and neuron connections occur during your REM sleep, all right? You do have, you actually do dream in your deep sleep? Slightly? Not a lot. Most of your dreaming occurs in REM sleep, but in your non-REM sleep, you do dream slightly. Sorry, just know not all dreaming occurs in REM sleep. Most of your memory consolidation occurs in REM sleep. Without reaching REM, you will all experience cognitive impairment. All right? So you guys dream. Weird things happen in your dreams. REM sleep is super important because in your dreams, creativity is kind of where creativity in fact recall happens. So your brain with your dreams is trying to connect abstract ideas to abstract ideas and relate them together. That's why dreams are like super bizarre. And they have things that don't relate. Your brain's trying to make connections to them that you don't necessarily see during the day. That later in life, a couple weeks during later in recall, you'll, those connections will actually start to occur because they're forming during the dream sleep. Right? Alcohol impairs REM sleep. Right? Your best memory consolidation, the best cycles of REM sleep, occur in your first and second REM cycle, or first and second sleep cycle, and your fifth sleep cycle. All right? Alcohol impairs your first and second sleep cycle. It normally wakes you up and doesn't make you do your fifth sleep cycle. So drinking impairs cognitive function, not just by making you stupid when you're drinking, but it impairs the ability of your brain to consolidate post-alcohol. Make sense? All right, sleep cycle, you know, average is about 90 minutes, give or take. They get longer throughout the night. Normally start at like 70 minutes and go up to about 110 minutes. A full night's sleep is considered about five sleep cycles, about seven and a half hours, you know, give or take depending on your body. Slide. All right, see how these sleep cycles go? You go from stage one down to stage four, where it talks about uh, brain waves, and you go back up to your REM sleep. After your REM sleep, you have this partial awakening period as your body trans transitions back into deep sleep, all right? And you can see REM sleep gets longer throughout the night. With your fifth cycle, if you're already sent out, your fifth cycle would be the longest, all right? So your memory consolidation gets longer towards the end. That's why your fifth cycle is one of your most important ones in the REM. That partial awakening period is the best time for you to wake up, all right? Anybody woken up out of a deep sleep and felt like crap for the day? Now you're, it just messes up your body rhythm. If you have one of those bands that tries to wake you up, from your sleep at the right time. It's feeling for when that movement shift changes from your REM sleep to where you're going to start back into stage one, that partial awakening period. And that's what it's trying to time. It gets you awake. All right. So, key takeaway. Stage one, sleep cycle one or two, best for memory. And five, REM sleep, super important. It's where you consolidate memory. Stage five was that fifth cycle occurring out towards seven and a half hours of sleep. If you continually sleep less than seven hours, seven and a half hours, you will have long-term cognitive impairment because you will not consolidate your memory. You will become less effective. All that information you learned 
you now become less effective because you're not consolidating. You can think you're getting used to sleeping six hours. Science says you don't. All right. So guys who have been in the army for 15 years, like, man, I can operate on six hours of sleep. You know, I don't need all that stuff. Science says, hey, you're wrong. So yeah, get over. It. All right, slide. All right. Sleep efficiency and sleep continuity. All right, so sleep efficiency talks about the amount of time you spend in bed and the amount of time you are asleep as you're in bed. So if you go to bed at 10 o'clock, wake up at 6 o'clock, 8 hours, and you slept for 7 hours and 45 minutes of that, because you woke up 10 minutes to sleep, you woke up for 5 minutes, you know, you're at like 92%. All right. If you sleep for, if you are three consecutive nights with restricted sleep, um, think if you're doing weapons guard or something like that, we only sleep for four and a half hours. Yeah, your sleep becomes really efficient because you fall asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow. All right? So your sleep efficiency increases. Where this plays into control base, all right? Sleep efficiency greatly is decreased when your sleep, say you only get four and a half hours, but it's continually broken up <coughs> to where you're at 90 minutes. Then I'm on a 45 minute guard shift. Then I'm on 90 minutes. Then I'm on a 45 minute guard shift. Your sleep efficiency now drastically drops to 58% because you spend that much more time trying to fall asleep, waking back up, trying to fall asleep, waking back up. So if you can, when you're scheduling like with each other, try to build in bigger blocks of sleep to increase that sleep efficiency rather than smaller guard shifts where you spend a lot of time falling asleep and waking back up. All right? So don't think like, hey, four and a half hours of sleep on this graph is smooth. I'm good because that's higher than 92%. That's not what we're getting at. We're looking at the 58% versus 90%. The only reason is four and a half hours is more efficient after three nights is you're that much more tired. So you fall asleep that much quicker. Make sense? All right, slide. All right, likelihood of injury based on hours of sleep per night. All right, so if you sleep less than seven or eight to seven hours, you are 1.7 times more likely to get injured. If you're sleeping less, you're going to get hurt. Why? Because you're not hitting that deep sleep. Your body's not repairing itself. It's not recovering from those workouts. So you're going to get hurt. All right? So, oh, you're going to get sick, too. Again, your body's not recovering. You're four and a half times more likely to get sick if you're sleeping less than seven hours. Most... 50% of the course you can control your own sleep. Here's where this is all going to come into play and you can screw yourself. Alright, GLP's week. You guys manage your time atrociously. Absolutely atrocious. And a lot of you will stay up and work on projects super late before getting sleep. And then you come in and you brief one of us, your product. One, your product is bad because you did it at like 3 in the morning. But you can never answer any of our questions because you didn't sleep, consolidate any of that information in your REM sleep, and you have impaired cognitive function, so you're not quick on your feet, and your grade tanks. You're better at a 85% product and being functional the next day briefing us than 100% product, and if we ask you a question, you can't remember why you put that on the board. Okay, right? Agreed? No? Here's your destiny. You have eight hours to get this <laughs> That's the blurting. That's the blurting. Right? So when, when you're trying to learn something or learn a new class, your best bet is to sleep more rather than spend all this time studying because your brain doesn't consolidate the information until you go to sleep. Alright? Make sense? Slide. Alright. So you get a bad night's sleep. Right? It all happens. No? Way to counteract that is napping, right? It ain't, it ain't like this evil thing, all right? Napping, what it does is if we're talking 15 to 20 minute naps. We ain't talking like you went down for an hour and a half, you West Pointer slept through all the Dean's hours, all right? We're just talking a 15 to 20 minute nap. Hey, it's going to restore wakefulness. It's going to promote learning and it's going to boost your memory. You know, it restores that alertness. It's an easy way to get some relaxation and it reduces your mental fatigue because it helps your brain shut down for a period of time. You know? It reduces stress and decreases your um, increases your immune response, right? So instead of immunosuppression, you're a little more responsive. And it reverses the hormonal impact of having a poor night's sleep. One of the better ways to do it is have a caffeine beverage, coffee, monster, something like that, before you take a nap, so then by the time it's processed into your system, 
you're awake and now you have an additional stimulant to help you. How caffeine works in the brain is you have receptors. They absorb neurotransmitter sleep chemicals and say, hey, I'm tired. What caffeine does is it blocks those neurotransmitters, right? Caffeine molecules, they bind to neurotransmitters, allowing you to feel like you're more awake because it's blocking the sleep chemicals. But everybody's had that crash out of having a caffeine beverage because those neurotransmitters leave. The sleep chemicals have still been building in your brain this whole time. Now they flood in, hit those neurotransmitters, and you crash hard. That's how caffeine works. It's a short-term solution. The long-term solution is get some sleep. But <laughs> caffeine, in this sense, is a short-term solution to help get you through your next problem. All right, slide. All right. Checklist for a better night's sleep. One, you want a quality, sleep, a quiet sleep environment. All right? You want to maintain a cooler room temperature. Your body temperature drops when you get into that deep sleep. All right? If it's warmer, now you have a bigger gap between your body temperatures, which makes you feel hotter. If you sleep in a cooler room, you decrease that difference, all right? And it helps your body throughout the night stay asleep. You want to ensure bedding is clothed, is comfortable and not too hot. Sleep routine, consistency. Your body functions on consistency. Circadian rhythms. You go to bed the same time as best you can, wake up the same time as best you can. Even if you lost a night of sleep, it's better to stay in your sleep rhythm to get back on because your body's going to function on that. Don't like, you didn't sleep, so now instead of waking up at 8 o'clock on a Saturday because you didn't sleep all week, you're going to sleep until 1300. You're going to cause your body to take more time to get out of whack, especially if things coming out of platoon sticks. You need to sleep all of, like, all of Saturday, and then you're out of rhythm for all of the next week at TLPs. So if you keep a consistent <coughs> rhythm, your body recovers quicker. Avoid caffeine and fluids before going to bed. Obviously, avoid fluids because you're going to wake up in the bathroom at night time. <coughs> Decrease in sleep efficiency. All right. Avoid the use of computer tablet, things like that. Blue lights in the back of these electronic devices, they decrease melatonin production. Who's got an iPhone? Brand new one. Or six, seven, that has the night shift app. Turn on the night shift app, what's your screen look like? Yellow? Mm -hmm. Yellowish. Takes out the blue light. Why? To allow you to continue to produce melatonin instead of the blue lights that kill melatonin production. Certain people, they buy like blue light blocker glasses or like yellowish like shooting glasses and walk around their house at night. Super weird. I'm not on that level yet. So. <laughs> but the night shift app helps. Things like that. I'm waiting for my TV to get a night shift app. Then I can watch it all the time. All right. And then napping, not later in the afternoon because it messes up your rhythm. Long, excessive naps. Hey, sleeping more than seven hours is a benefit. In a dark room with no light source present. Why? Because it deals with circadian rhythm and melatonin reduction. What questions have we got on sleep and nutrition? In the back. I recently heard the concept of sleep debt and kind of making up for that sleep debt so if you have like one or two days of or at least two nights of not getting enough sleep and you spend that third day trying to recover from that sleep deficit. Um, don't you stay with that? We get out of our sleep rhythm to make up for our sleep debt. I think that's detrimental for our next few days. It depends on how much of a sleep debt you lost. Like if we're talking like an hour left or right, stick with your rhythm. Like a long term, like a couple days of losing sleep, you want to, you can make that sleep debt, or you can plan ahead. So I've seen studies where they did sleep in like seven hours and sleep in nine hours, and then they did a night of no sleep, and then they did a performance test the next day. The guys who slept nine hours actually performed better because they were able to store a little bit of sleep in the short term. In the long term, that sleep debt, like you can make physical sleep debt up, the cognitive impairment you don't necessarily make up by sleeping more. Does that make sense? Physical restorative for performance, yes, you can make up from a sleep debt. Cognitive performance, no, because you miss that time to consolidate those memories. Uh, what about rest periods and uh, your sleep through uh, melatonin supplements or z so you don't have to have that? Melatonin and Z-Pro work slightly a little bit different. One's more like a Benadryl type supplement. Uh, slightly been linked to Alzheimer's in the long run. A melatonin. Some research says in the long term your body will stop producing melatonin. Which, okay, if your body stops producing melatonin, you're stuck taking it for a long period of time. You know, preferably if you can get a 
good sleep rhythm going, and if you need melatonin in the short term to help regulate, nothing wrong with that. In the long term, there's not a ton of research out on how effective it's going to be for the long term consequences of years of taking melatonin. That good? Any other questions from the class in general? Like PT, anything? <coughs>